Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Johnny Robertson, and you're here with us on uh, What Does the Bible Say? Let's go up to our graphic and let everybody see where we are. Um, we are having a special discussion tonight, myself and Mr. Charles Gold. Uh, we want you to know, too, on our broadcast that you can uh, get in touch with us on email, Bible says 81 at hotmail.com, or you can get on our website, martinsville.tv slash Bible, and or you can call me anytime on my cell phone. So uh, let's drop off of that. What we're doing tonight is we're going to have a discussion in regard, right, I'd say around the subject of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, having to do with is Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever. And uh, one thing that I, I failed to do that, go up to my graphic right quick and I'll grab my timer. Uh, one thing I want to do, and uh, we don't have a picture that we can actually uh, stay with in here. Uh, I want to advertise our tent meeting that's coming up. We want everybody to um, participate in that if you like. We're, we're going to be having a special discussion now. We're going to be having a debate uh, along with that tent meeting. That's going to be in Pelham, North Carolina. Uh, if you don't know where Pelham is, Pelham is the first exit off of 29 as you enter into North Carolina. And uh, uh, as soon as you enter into North Carolina, you see the Welcome Center. That's Pelham, North Carolina. That road also goes to Eden. As soon as you exit there, you will see our tent off to the left if you're heading towards North Carolina. If you're coming from Reedsville, you just look to the right before you get to that exit and you'll see our tent sitting there. So that's going to be June the 12th through the 24th. One thing we want you to know is there's going to be no collections during that tent meeting, so you come along and bring your Bible. That's all we want you to do. We want you to participate with us in it. If you don't know where Pelham is, here's a quick map. Uh, Pelham, North Carolina is um, right there on 29, as you can see that. Uh, right uh, after you get out of Danville, those persons who are in Danville, I think most everybody's going to know where that is. So we're going to actually start preaching at 730, but the debate... Uh, between a gentleman named Olin Hicks and Gary Summers. Olin Hicks is from Arkansas. Gary Summers is from Florida. They're going to be discussing marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Who actually can marry? And uh, who can scripturally marry? And people like Jerry Falwell saying everybody can marry today. Jerry Falwell changed his position in the last uh, four years, and basically he's now uh, uh, welcoming everybody in. The Baptists that I talk to, many of them are giving up their license, so they don't have to stand against all these divorced people. But we're going to have a discussion five nights under the tent so that you'll be able to determine uh, who's really telling the truth. All right, uh, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion. We're going to let uh, uh, Mr. Charles Gold go first. We can drop off our graphic right quick. And uh, we're going to let him go for 10 minutes uninterrupted and uh, basically give his position in regard to uh, the Holy Ghost and things having to do with that. And then I'm going to come along behind him and give what I believe the Bible says. So if you all drop the graphic and come back to us, we'll uh, start in on that right now. So I'm in my 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Now. First off, I'd like to say praise the Lord to everyone. And I would like to give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as with all Bible discussions or preaching or teaching that I enter into, I have prayer first. So I'm going to go into a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, it is in the name of Jesus the Christ that we come before you as humble as we know how. First of all, to say thank you for your love and kindness, and thank you for the multitude of your tender mercies. We thank you that we're here at this point in time. We ask you now to have your way in this building. Anoint us, let us act as gentlemen, and let us delve into your word. Not that we might glorify ourselves, but we might glorify you and edify your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. The topic and the question that I was asked about and asked to come on to discuss was whether the Lord was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Uh, Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then also Galatians 4.4 4 is an important scripture because it says in the fullness of time, Jesus came. And that being the basis in the fullness of time, Jesus did not come, amen, just haphazardly or just, out of, just fall out of the sky. But he came according to God's plan, a plan that was formed before the foundation of the world. And when Jesus, amen, came, amen, he was fulfilling what God had already put in place. Just as God every day causes the sun to course across the sky and has done it since he created this earth and the world, amen. Just as God, amen, is in control right now, amen. Seems like the world is in chaos, but God is still in control. And that being the case, amen, that God had a master plan to start with. He doesn't have to change. God doesn't have to change, okay? 
if he has a master plan in place, the master plan, the Bible plainly says, amen, that when his word has gone out of his mouth, it will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish the thing he pleases, the thing wherein he sent it. So that being the case, he doesn't have to change. It's man that has to change. It's man that has to give up his wicked ways and conform to God. So then we need to understand that when God set the plan in place, it's going to come to pass just as he said it would. Things are going to fall in place just as he said it would. And nothing haphazardly or nothing by chance, nothing by chance, but that God will affect things. He doesn't have to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And many people don't believe that God heals today. And I was trying to think about how I was going to tell the world that God still heals today. But I thought that the best way for me to tell the world is what he's done for me, how I've come out of things and how I've overcome certain things just because God did it. Not I did it or the doctor did it, but because God did it. I can tell you about testimonies where I've been in services where they stand up and testify how the doctor have diagnosed them with cancer and how, amen, when they went back and they prayed, just as uh, the Bible says, go to the elders, if there are any sick among you, go to the elders of the church, and the prayer of faith, amen, will heal you, amen. And I understand, amen, that God will heal you if you ask him. I understand that the office and the power of the Holy Ghost is still working today, and it works in only those who ask for it. If you really want the Holy Ghost and you ask God for it, he'll give it to you. And when he gives it to you, then you'll understand. Then you'll understand the power. You can't preach. You can't teach the word of God. You can't correctly do it without having the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. It's the thing that leads you, and it's the thing that guides you into all truth. It's the thing that causes you to understand the word of God better. When you have maybe a carnal and a fleshly understanding of the word of God, it gives you that spiritual understanding that you can go ahead and you can grow in God with it. Amen. When you got it in you. And nobody can tell you any different because you know that you know that you know. And it makes no difference who says anything to you or bothers you about it. Yes, God set this plan of salvation in motion before the foundation of the world. For Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And if this plan is in motion, and when this plan is in motion, now excuse me for saying if, but knowing that this plan is in motion, God has no need of changing. God has no need of changing directions. God has no need of, he said, before heaven and earth will pass away, not one jot, one tittle of the law will pass away. The law is written, the law is down, and it's not going to pass away. Everything is going to come to pass, just as he said it would. All you have to do is believe in him and trust him. The Bible says he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And I say, what level are you seeking him on? If you seek him on a level, if you believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, then seek him on the highest level you can. Seek to have that oneness with him when he puts that spirit in you. And you come to the place where you're heirs, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. And you're joint heirs with him because you have the Father's spirit in you, just like he had it in him. He said, if you walk up before, upright before me, I'll withhold no good thing from you. So once you do that and you learn how to walk upright before him, and the Holy Ghost is a thing that can keep you day in and day out, all you have to do is listen to it. When you start to step wrong, when you start to go right or left, off of the path, off of the right path, it's almost like an alarm down inside of you that lets you know that you're headed in the wrong direction. And it can keep you on the straight and narrow. And it can keep you where God wants you. And you can grow and you can become one with God. You can have his spirit in you day in, day out, leading you and guiding you, helping you to accomplish the things that he wants you to accomplish, wants you to accomplish. We were speaking off camera, and we were talking about, I could not explain the anointing to John Robinson. And it's the thing, amen, that is so great and so powerful in you that you feel it, and it goes out of you. And when you're preaching the gospel, you feel it, and you know it's there. And it brings that beautiful joy. And not only that, it has a tendency, the Bible says, it destroys the yoke. And it seems to drive the word home even better. And there's, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. It's too, too, too broad, too big for me to comprehend, to be able to put it into words. But I know the feeling, and I love it. 
All right, we've got um, um, two minutes actually left, so I'm going to give that back to you when we uh, start up again, because you may want have more that you want to talk about when we when I get through. So we'll give you that two minutes back. Um, let's go to our, our graphic tonight, friends. I, I want to say begin the beginning. I have nothing personally uh, that I dislike about uh, Mr. Charles Goes. Matter of fact, I appreciate him very much for coming on tonight. I, I applaud his courage and determination to spread his form of doctrine. And so the information that I'm saying, I hope that no one will say that that is a personal uh, affront in any way. I, I'm basically saying this about all apostolic, all Church of God, in Christ, all Church of God denominations, all United Pentecostal, all of the charismatic movement, I'm saying the same thing. There's an unbelievable blindness out there. In Matthew 15, verse 14, the record says, Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now you might ask, well, why is it that you would say that this kind of blindness is out there? I want to just let you see uh, three clips, and I want you to notice the blindness that I'm talking about. Individuals who will claim a thing and then turn around and contradict themselves and not see it, but other people are seeing it. Watch this clip. Watch these clips. Her eyes. Yes, Lord. Open. Yes. In the name of Jesus. So far, the most popular program airs on Friday nights, when Hall and local pastor Stephen Tinch take crowns, all connected with so-called BTW 21. I command her eyes. Yes, Lord. Open. Yes. In the name of Jesus. So far, the most popular program airs on Friday nights, when Hall and local pastor Stephen Tinch take phone calls and attempt miracles on the air. And on this night, a caller says their prayers returned her eyesight. She can see. Glory to God. Did you hear that, brother? Hallelujah. The lady that we prayed for her eyesight, she had lost her eyesight. The blind are seeing. Just feel her in the name of Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, friends, what you just saw was them claiming that someone was healed from blindness. Now, Chad Hall attends a church called the Martinsville Church of God. Well, so does this gentleman right here. His name is Mark Stocks. He's their music minister. Now, listen what he's inviting you to come and hear, uh, who he's inviting you to come and hear over at the Church of God. Having her to come to your church. Uh, one reason uh, Jana is so inspirational is... Um, she happens to be a non-sighted individual, and uh, she's a woman of faith. She will get on an airplane now, by herself. a non-sighted, for those of you who are not clear on that, means she's blind. Here, he's trying to get you to come hear a blind lady minister to you and telling you that she is a woman of great faith, and the producer of the show, Chad Hall, who goes to church over there at Church of God, is actually telling you that he just participated in, in seeing a blind person healed. <clears throat> it would take a blind person spiritually not to see through that. Now, watch this one. This is another clip from within their sanctuary. Their calling was to pray and preach. Pray and minister the word. That's what they said. Pray and preach. Listen, listen to me. We've got some Stevens in this house that have the power. We've got some Stevens in this house that have the power to do what the preacher can do, praise God, that can do what the pastor can do. Who do you think I am? I'm just a man just like you are. And we've got young men and young women and older men and older women. We've got all kinds of ages of people in here that have got the power just like I've got the power. They've got faith, and they will go out in the name of Jesus and lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Now, I'm going to stop right there because most people don't catch this when they see it, but right to his right is a lady signing to deaf people. They claim to be able to heal the blind, and then one of their ministers says, come here a blind person of faith. Then you watch them express that they have the power that Stephen had and the power that they actually claim, and then he walks off of the rostrum, and there's a lady who is signing to a deaf person. Excuse me, but I remember in the first century that the blind were healed and the deaf were healed, but these individuals do not have this power, but people in this community are so blind spiritually that they don't see through this. How is it that you have the power to help one person see, and then you invite me to come and hear another blind person who is a blind person of faith. That is absolutely a contradiction. And friends, that's the kind of thing we're pointing out. Now, as, w as we go on this, my first statement is going to be, in, ja in Hebrews 13, verse 8, the Bible does say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But in what sense? Does that mean that everything about Jesus and everything about God is the same in the way he operates and the way he uh, controls things? If I remember, Jesus walked upon this earth for 38, 33 years. He's not here today. In one sense, he's not the same. In other words, he's not here physically. 
quickly as he was then. Well, if Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever, my first statement is going to be, and if we can, as you read that, I'm going to ask Mr. Go to give me his Bible because he doesn't need it. Now, someone might say, well, why are you saying that, Johnny? Well, notice what the Bible says in John 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, that he can't explain this great feeling, but I can explain it to you. Here's the way it would actually operate on him. But the Holy Ghost, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, if Mr. Goad had the Holy Ghost the way they had it in the first century, he wouldn't even need his Bible tonight. And I want to suggest to you that he didn't have Holy Spirit enough to go his full 10 minutes in refuting what I'm saying tonight. And I want you to listen to the only person in Henry County that I have heard, he's not actually from Henry County, but he's the only person that I've heard who will be consistent with this. At least he will claim that he has it. Listen to this clip. With the so-called sermon on it, that's not God's messenger. Amen. God's messenger don't have to pre-plan a message. God's messenger don't have to sit up all night and write out a message. All he got to do is go to the truth that was healed before him. Amen. Now, friends, drop that graphic just for a minute. That's Geno Jennings, and he challenged me from Philadelphia that he was going to come down and have a discussion with me, and he got here making all these claims about the Holy Ghost, and we had two hours of extra time along with his one hour of time, and do you know the man wouldn't come out of his hotel room? Here's a man who claims to have the Holy Ghost. Look at our graphic. In Matthew 19, verse 20, notice what the Bible says. Excuse me, Matthew 10, verse 19 through 20, it says, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak, for it is not you that speaketh, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. He didn't come meet me on television after he had told everybody he was coming down here to slay all the false teachers. He wouldn't come out of his hotel room at all. As a matter of fact, the only thing I heard from Geno Jennings' camp is a bunch of people giving me excuses how come Geno Jennings wasn't prepared for his schedule to come up and meet me. Well, friends, he's the one who said that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and he doesn't have to prepare. And the Holy Spirit said yesterday that a person who was being challenged and being held up as a false teacher doesn't even have to worry about what he has to say. The Holy Spirit will give him in an hour what he needs to say. And I'm asking Mr. Go to give up his Bible and give the rest of the discussion without the Bible. Now, when he did that, I'm going to ask him some questions here in a little bit that's going to involve some Bible answers. And if he doesn't know those Bible answers and doesn't know the Scripture off the top of his head, we're going to be able to tell that the Holy Spirit is not really operating on him in the sense that it was in the first century. Now, here's another. Here's another statement if you'll look at this. When I asked them to give a demonstration, if you'll notice our graphic, of the Holy Spirit in their lives today, in other words, to help me to believe them rather than just to have to hear their talk, this is their response. If you can look at my graphic right quick. It said, this is their response. Well, we can't demonstrate to a wicked generation. Well, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 and 39 does say to a person that uh, the uncertain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall not be a sign given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. But friends, I want you to notice this. In Matthew 12, now we're in Matthew 12, 39. But in Matthew 12, 10, notice what has been happening prior to Jesus' statement. And behold, there was a man with his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might uh, accuse him? Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it forth, and it rest restored whole as the other. That's one miracle. Matthew 12, verse 15. But Jesus knew it, that when he withdrew himself from thence, and a great multitude followed them, and he healed them all. Matthew 12, 22. There was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and the Dumb spake, uh, the dumb spake and saw. Now, I have just noticed in that context three uh, uh, settings of miracles, and, and Matthew 12, 15 is a lot of miracles. He healed a lot of people. Now, this is what I'm saying. If they tell me a wicked and adulterous seek, uh, uh, a generation seek as a sign and they want to do like they did in the New Testament, they've got to give me some signs. That Jesus was doing all kinds of miracles in front of them, and yet they still ask him for a sign. These people have done nothing in front of us. They've demonstrated nothing but talk, talking about subjective feelings, how they feel and what it's like, and it's unexplainable. That's not the way it was in the New Testament. All right, look at this. In the uh, page 22 on the UPC, the United Pentecostal Manual, Article of Faith, it says that the way you know a person has the Holy Ghost is through evidence of speaking in tongues. They actually want you to demonstrate that you can speak in tongues before they will accept that you have the Holy Ghost. Now, that seems like they're looking for a sign if you ask me. Notice what it was like in the first century. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, this is what Paul said. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words, man's wisdom, talking about I can feel it and I just can't tell you about it. But what was 
it like in the first century when Jesus was uh, giving that power? But in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. Listen to Creflo Dollar. At least he will be consistent when he says that they ought to be like the first century when Jesus was the same then. Spend no time with Jesus. And in these last days, it's going to take a demonstration of the power. And we, we won't be able to demonstrate the power if we don't think we have a right. It's going to take a demonstration of the power. It's not going to be enough just to preach the gospel. It's going to take a demonstration of the power of God. It's going to take somebody that believes God and has enough confidence in God to go to somebody that's blind, somebody that's lame, somebody that's dead, somebody that's sick, somebody that's broke, and say, the anointing of God is on me. All right, I agree 100% with him. It's going to take somebody who will demonstrate something other than talk. Well, here's your man. Look what he says. Faith. It's a matter of what you believe. I believe that in Jesus' name, the sick are going to be healed. I believe in Jesus' name, the dead will be raised. Oh, well, that's, you know, that, that. I'm going to run out of time. I'll finish that in a minute. He goes on and talk, talk, talk. And you saw him over there a while ago with a blind woman signing. But he believes all of this. Okay, we're going to go, let uh, Mr. Gold go again. First off, I would like to say that you should follow the words there in Matthew. And it says, leave them alone. Did it not, uh, what, that not the first word you said? It said, leave them alone. If you're asking me, I'll go ahead and tell you what the other part of the verse says. Leave them alone. You said it was the blind leading the blind, and they both right. should fall into the ditch. They said. Well, if, that, if that's the case, then leave them alone and let them fall into the ditch the like the word the verse. says. Here's the rest of the verse. They came and said, do you not know that they are offended? And Jesus said unto them, leave them alone. The blind lead the blind. They'll both fall in the ditch. I'm leaving them alone. I'm trying to get the people out here who are actually following you guys. That's who I'm talking to tonight. Yep. And what I say is that it's real. It's real. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is real. And the fact that God doesn't have to boast himself to show unbelievers. You have, the Bible plainly says that when Jesus went home, he said a prophet is not without honor except among his own people and his own kin. And he was not able to do many works there because of their unbelief. And when you come to the place that you have the faith to believe, he asked some that he healed, did they have the faith to believe? Did they have the faith that they could be healed? And when he saw that they had the faith, one man said, help thou my unbelief. In other words, Lord, give me what I need because they wanted to be healed. Okay? And the desire, and I'll point out another point too, not everyone during that first century time was healed, was it? Not everyone was healed. But some were healed and some weren't. We don't know the mind of God. We don't know the will of God. We don't know when he will heal and when he won't heal. The healing does not come from man. It comes from God. And we have to have the faith in order to get healed, in order to get anything from God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we must have that faith in him. I have faith enough in God to where my vehicle doesn't move unless I pray first. I want him with me when my vehicle moves. I don't lay down at night unless I pray first because I want him there watching over me while I slumber and sleep. When I rise in the morning, my faith says, give this day to God. You may have to go out to your job, but you can only go out to your job if God is with you. You can only accomplish the things that you have to accomplish through the day if God is with you. Now, you may say many people in the world go out and accomplish what they have to accomplish, and they don't pray and they don't do this. I say to you this, I feel better when I know that I have prayed and I have given God the reins of my life, and I trust and I believe in him. And I'm not saying every day goes perfect, but I'm saying that I have peace and I have joy and I have confidence in God. And yes, I said, you can't explain it. You can't, as one songwriter says, you can't attain it. All I know is that that is there and that it comforts me. I know that it makes me feel so good inside when I know his presence is there. And I know that without his spirit in me, I'm none of his. And if I'm none of his, then I'm lost, period. You must get the Holy Ghost in you to be part of God's kingdom. Nicodemus, God told him, Jesus told him, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit, or you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And many of you just feel that the Holy Ghost is just another 
spiritual gift. It is the gift that makes all the other gifts operate. You have to have that first or nothing else will operate. Now you talk about showing the signs and wonders. I'm not going to get up here and try to do all of that and, and try to be something. But when God sees the time and the need for the spirit to move, Johnny Robinson, are you sick? Do you need healing? There's no need for it here. But when the need comes, when the need comes that a soul can be healed from cancer, when a need comes, a woman calls you in the middle of the night and she's bleeding and the bleeding can't be stopped and can't be controlled and she knows something is wrong and you pray, you stop talking to her on the phone and you start praying and when you call her back, the blood is stopped then you know God has moved. And that lady, that same lady, she had a, a more serious disorder. But at that moment, she was afraid she was going to bleed to death. And so when that blood stopped, we knew God had moved. I knew the instant the blood had stopped. And when I went back and called her again, she said, yes, it had stopped. And then she proceeded on to the hospital. And, and she got that other problem, the main problem, corrected. God is an on-time God, and he's, he's not about play, and he's not about falseness and fake, but you must have the faith to see him operate. When you allow the power of God and the Spirit of God to move in your life, there's no mistaking it, and anybody in the world can speak against it, and they can speak against it because they don't know, and they don't understand it, and they don't know what's happening, but when I see it coming, I know. <clears throat> now, we're not going, I'm not going to fall into your game, Johnny. It's not a game. Yes, it is a game. a game. It's a game, and I don't play that. I'm sorry. There's plenty of people in this. In I this don't area. play that. Just I did not just, ahead. I just said that God, that some people didn't get healed in the first century. Everyone didn't get healed. And this man may, is not going to get healed more than likely. That's right. More than likely, okay. But until you come to the place where you realize. Can he pay him? Till you come to the place where you realize that God will do what he said he will do when he wants to do it, and you give him his glory, all, you, all you're going to be is sounding brass and tinkling simple, my friend. I know what God can do. I've seen it. So I'm not worried about anybody you bring on the set, any kind of uh, surprise that you do, okay? And I won't withhold prayer from that man. I'll pray for him, and I'll pray that God will heal him, okay, because that's what God has told me to do. I'll pray for him, and I'll pray that God will heal him. And no doubt if he has the faith, God will heal him. But I'm not about playing your little games. Okay. You still have five minutes? I don't need them. All right. All right, friends. Basically, what we did is we just really... Uh, we called Mr. Gold's Bluff. He said, Johnny, are you sick? He said, is there a need for healing? There's no need for healing. Therefore, we're not going to have a healing. Uh, Marshall is with me tonight, and Marshall and I are not in the same religion. I happen to know Marshall as a result of him coming to some Bible studies that have been conducted uh, in a discussion before uh, uh, we actually went on. I learned that uh, Marshall basically was born with palsy. And uh, he's an individual who is, is trying to live, to the best of his knowledge, a, a good and righteous life. People all over Martinsville and Henry County know him. They know this is no game. And they realize that healing is needed. And we've already had Mr. Goad backing up now. He says that there's not going to be any healing here tonight. And I knew there wasn't. He's going to pray for him. That's my turn, so don't even start. Go ahead. I'm and uh, uh, basically what we could have tonight is uh, we could have a demonstration, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so we can have that, or uh, we can have what we're getting from Mr. Goad tonight. We're getting a lot of talk. Now, yesterday, in the first century, folks, they were quick to demonstrate. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, the Bible says, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. The way you would know that Mr. Goat is really true, you wouldn't have all this talk about I feel it and can't explain it. He would demonstrate and it'd be over. I'd shut up. There would be no way that I could actually answer what he's saying because the demonstration would outdo the talking. And see, friends, that's all we hear today is we hear talking. Now, if we're going we're to look at our screen, 
One of the things he said, and I knew he would say this, he said, well, we're not going to be able to do this because of your unbelief. Now, as soon as our uh, producer gets back to his, his seat there, we're going to go back up to our screen. And notice the Bible does say in Matthew 13, verse 58, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. I believe that I heard Mr. Gold say that it wasn't possible, that he couldn't do it because of their unbelief. It says he did not many mighty works in that particular instance. But I want you to back up with me, if you would, to Matthew 11, verse 20. Listen to this verse. You can read it there on your screen. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Jesus did most of his mighty works, and these people were so unbelieving that they still didn't repent. And notice who he compares them to. Their unbelief level was actually comparable to the most wretched individuals in biblical history. Notice, here it comes, 11.23, Matthew 11.23. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted under the heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. You see, Jesus did many, many mighty works in many different places, and it wasn't because he could not. He chose not to because of their unbelief. The Bible very clearly says, and you just saw it, that he chose not to, but in this particular instance in Capernaum, he had done most of his mighty works in the most unbelieving area. Then look again in Matthew 17, 15 through 16, the only time there was a failure in healing in the New Testament, the only time that you find a failure in healing, it was not the person like Marshall who is being said to not have enough faith. It was the persons doing the healing. Look at our graphic, Matthew 17, 15 through 16. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falls into the fire and often to the water, and I brought him to the disciples and they could not cure him. Why, Jesus? Why couldn't they cure him? That's what the disciples asked. And then said the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, the person's doing the healing. And the reason why Marshall is not getting the benefit of Jesus Christ yesterday is because Charles Go doesn't have what is available yesterday. And if anybody's at fault, it's not Marshall. It is the person trying to do the healing. If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, who is that? The person doing the healing. You shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it this kind go without not by but by prayer and fasting so that was the only instance that a person wasn't healed when there was a trial put forth now notice this james 5 14 through 15 again the healing is put on the person doing the healing the power is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the pastor i believe that uh, Mr. Gold would be a pastor today, or certainly someone he knows is a pastor. Let them, that is the pastor, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, who's doing the praying? The pastor shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. You see, it's not fair to put it on, on um, um, Mr. Marshall here and let Mr. Gold have a free pass when, in fact, the New Testament very squarely puts it on the person doing the healing. He's got to have some faith, too. And he already said there's not going to be any healing going on today. All he's going to do is pray. And see, that's all they all do. They go to the doctor just like I do. We're not discussing tonight, friends, does God heal? I believe that God heals. I believe that God heals in conjunction with natural order that he put into place before he put the Holy Ghost out in the first century. I believe that God does many things according to natural order along with the things that he has also placed out there, such as doctors. I notice most of them have health insurance. If I believe this, and it was the same as in the first century, I wouldn't buy a single dime of health insurance. I would go to the pastor every time I was sick, and I'd ask him for prayer. And the Bible says in the first century that there was a time frame when they were being healed, and they're not doing it today. It is not the same. Now, look at this. Lack of faith. My question is, is it a lack of faith tonight on Marshall's part or on my part, or is it just stingy? He said a moment ago that everybody wasn't healed. Let's look and see what the Bible says. Matthew 4, 24, and his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought him unto, all, brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and he healed them. The Bible says he brought, they brought all these sick people, and he healed them. Well, someone might say, well, he didn't heal all them. Well, Matthew 8, 16, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and cast out spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. We just keep on going. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus went all about the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. These folks don't heal anyone. I'm going to tell you this tonight, friends. And I want you to look at me. This is not about us boasting. I want you to know tonight, if I had this power, and we're going to discuss whether or not the man has the power, God has the power. We're going to get down to what the Bible says. If this power was available for me, I wouldn't stop with Marshall. I'm going to tell you, sir, Marshall, 
I would help you find that what you're looking for, and you wouldn't find me sleeping very much. You would actually have to make me go to sleep. I would go to all the hospitals. I would go to all the nursing homes 24-7. I would be giving this power out, giving this gift out, and these folks don't have anybody to demonstrate. He told me on the phone he wished he could think of somebody to bring up here mm -hmm. who had been healed, but he can't find anybody, but I can sure find somebody who needs to be healed, and this is no game. This gentleman is not in the same church with me. We haven't seen each other in two and a half years, I would say, uh, before uh, uh, Miss uh, Shirley and Sammy were in that Bible study. That's the first time we've seen each other since then. This is no game. This is an honest man, and I'm an honest man, and we're putting this man to the test, and the Bible says that you can try the spirits, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. You try the spirits to see if they're real. And we'll look back at our graphic again. In Acts chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, the apostles did the same thing, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And there came also a multitude out of cities around about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Where is this idea that they didn't all get healed? When they came out to be healed, they were all healed, every single one. And if somebody wasn't healed, like that lunatic in Matthew chapter 17, they were upbraided because of their lack of faith. And it wasn't the problem with the lunatic. Friends, a lunatic doesn't know. He doesn't know whether Jesus is Jesus or not. He doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't have any faith. He was healed without any faith. John 9, 31, the blind man, he didn't even know who Jesus was, even after Jesus had healed him. He just knew that he was healed. This idea that it's our our fault because they are empty and don't have the power of the first century is absolutely false. Now notice this. Here's another ploy. We can't do anything. It's of God. Friends, read your Bible. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 8, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. He's shaking his head over here, but he can't make the Bible go away. The Bible says the power is in the men. Luke 10, verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Behold, I, and Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'm going to take what the Bible says. Matthew chapter chapter 10, 1, and when he had called his 12 disciples, he gave them power against the unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Which do you want? What they say or what does the Bible say? Yesterday, my friends, on top of that, there was no church of Jesus Christ of our Lord apostolic. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, how come there wasn't a church of our Lord Jesus Christ apostolic? R.C. Lawson in their very own manual says that he established it, founded it in, in 1913. Is Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever? i tell you one thing, the church of Christ that I'm a member of was in existence back then, and it's still in existence today. And the UPC says, not only that, the UPC says, now sir, we're in my time right now, you can do what you want to during your time. In and uh, the UPC, uh, and I think he's going to be just like J.C. Richardson, he's not going to follow our instructions. I've been very courteous, and I've just basically held my peace during my 10 minutes. The UPC says that the truth of one in the Godhead, Jesus only, was revealed in 1910. Now, how is it that nobody else knew this idea about Jesus only before 1910, if Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever? Now, friends, I, we're seeing this demonstrated over and over. Now, if they were the church of Christ, why not act like it? Notice this in the first century. Now, Mr. Go, we're going to ask you this question. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27 28, in the first century, the Bible says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, this is yesterday, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let me ask you a question. Mr. Goad, if you're willing to answer this, in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ apostolic, which you're saying is the same today, yesterday, and forever, is the same as it was in the, in the first century, when y'all speak in tongues, do you speak one at a time, or does everybody speak at the same time? Can be one at a time. Other, I didn't say other, can be. I said, what do y'all do? Said, you said what do you do, and I said it can be one at a time. I've seen instances where it's one at a time. All right. I've seen instances where others speak in tongues when the Spirit falls on them. And when you speak in tongues, basically it shows the evidence of the Holy Ghost. Not only that, there's an unknown tongue that lets you know. Okay, you can start you're your time. To, you, you, it edifies you. It's a language between you and God that, put it like this, when I'm saying hallelujah, it's not coming out of my mouth hallelujah. But God is receiving it. And when I'm saying glory to God, it's not coming out of my mouth, glory to God, but something else. And that's between me and God. 
It's between me and Where's God. Where's that in the Bible? When I'm saying hallelujah, when I'm glorifying Where's God, that in the Bible? it's between me and God. Where's that And it's an unknown tongue. Where's that in the Bible? You just spoke about the unknown tongue. No, and I'm asking and you. And it's unknown to you. John 14, it's 26, unknown to you. Have miraculous memory. Where is it? You put now, your Bible so what I, you what I want to do, what I want to do is bring this man up that you brought in. Um, and if he has the faith, and I have the faith that you can be healed. I have the faith that you can be healed. That's I know, what you say. I know I said I know I said that it wouldn't wouldn't be a healing tonight, but I have the faith that you can be healed. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna put it off on him when it doesn't I, happen. I'm not gonna put it off on him, you see, because the healing might not take place in these few minutes. That's because it's not the way it's, it was it, yesterday. It, might, it says it says in that same hour in some instances, no, didn't it? Didn't. Yes it you, did. You, where is in that, that in the Bible? In that Where's same that hour they were healed. Where's in the Bible? It's there. No, it's, it's not. There. See, I, don't, I knew I don't have to open it up. You don't have any come up. John 14, Come up. what is his name? You know, Marshall, you what don't is, have what to do what name? he says. You don't have to you do don't it. You don't have to do what he says. But right in here, right now, come he, up. He don't need to be near you either. If, Jesus could heal a person if you, and they went up. back to their house and they come found up. out they was healed. When, when, Peter, when they went to the gate called Beautiful, man, and he fixed his eyes on him. And he said, in the name of Jesus. Just like that. In the name of Jesus. Just like that. Come up. That's not how you, it You're afraid to be on camera. He was already on camera. Uh... I'll go to him. Okay, good. I have no problem There's with that. There's nothing going to happen either way, but go ahead. This is what we wanted. <clears throat> I'll go to him. I have no problem. Uh, Tyler, if, you, if one of y'all can. Now, now, Marshall, anything you didn't agree to, you're fine to That's say right. no. You, you can say no. You can say no. I don't have to touch you. You can say no. You, do, do, will you allow me? How long can you stand? Can you stand for a moment? Look at me. Look at my eyes. Now, one thing we want to make sure on the camera, if you can get it around, is that this is nothing like what happened in the New Testament. He's having to go through all these rituals. Peter said... I'm going through no rituals. Yeah, well, well, why don't you just do what Peter said? Peter did. Okay. And I can't copy what Peter did. I have to do what God is leading me to do. Okay, look at my eyes. I'm going to touch your face. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come before you, your humble servant. This man comes in sick. He has need of healing. If this truly is need to be healed, Lord Jesus Christ, and if it is in your will, let it be done, Jesus, for his sake, that he might know the power of your Holy Spirit, that he might know and understand that you love him and you want him healed. It's not about show. It's not about any false doctrine or any unbelief, but knowing that you have the power to heal and that you will do it if it's asked in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I ask you right now in the name of Jesus, heal him, Lord. Heal him in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's all. That's it, and that's nothing happened. Now, friends, what we asked Charles to do is we said, give us the scripture where it said it didn't happen or it happened in the same hour or something like that. Now, John 14, 26, if you remember, said that he has miraculous memory. He can't remember that scripture because it's not in there, and nothing happened. And I apologize, uh, uh, Marshall, for... I apologize for uh, anything that you feel that you had to go through with him that I didn't tell you would happen. I knew what was going to happen on my end. He was going to do something, say something that was going to give him an opportunity to get off of the hot seat. Now you still have uh, now, you still have time, uh, Mr. Did, I'm back here sitting down. I didn't run from anything. You didn't do anything now, either. I prayed for that man. That's not what the Bible and, says. And uh, said a prayer of faith will do what? The fair faith will heal him. Every okay. healing in the New okay. Testament, that's what oh, we I'm saw. Sorry. This wasn't one of those. We I'm hadn't sorry. seen anything. It wasn't like that every time. Well, you show me one place. In that same hour. Show me that healed. place. Show me that and place. this man, like I said, I prayed for you. I thank God for being able to pray for you. Believe it. And go, when you leave here, believe it. Why does he have to wait? New Why? Testament, yesterday, they didn't have to wait. Uh, Why are you interrupting me? Didn't you have your time? Now, you asked me back did, and forth did, questions. Did you have, and, and you answered the question. Didn't you have your okay. time? Okay. Uh, if you want me to stay out of it, I will. Okay. Go ahead. So, now, walk in it and believe it. And don't let any man put any doubt in your mind. And that's the whole problem today. 
doubt and unbelief. God is real. His healing is real. Walk in the faith and walk in belief. I don't play your games, Johnny. This is not a game. That, yes, it is. It's a game that you play because you want to put down everybody else and make yourself look good. I'm not worried about making myself look good. I'm here for one reason, and that's to glorify God. And you, want, you can keep putting down and keep spouting off all you want to, and it's not going to do you any good at the end until you get the Holy Ghost in you and until you understand what the power is. You'll be blind. The scales have to fall from your eyes just like they fell from the Apostle Paul's eyes while he was Saul of Tarsus and he went to the street called Straight. Mm -hmm. And when those scales fall from your eyes, then you'll be enlightened. All right, friends. You saw it right here, and uh, this is where you get to see these things. Is on What does the Bible say? Nothing happened. We knew they weren't. Now, I asked uh, Charles a question, and I'm basically going to go back to it. If you look at our screen, I'm not going to ask him for the answer. We got his answer a while ago. Now, here was the question. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Now, he told me before we got started that his mother was a pastor. In the first century church yesterday, the Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also said the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for the woman to speak in the church. Now, also, it, when I ask him in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 27 through 28, and, and friends, you all know, if you watch them on TV, I want you to do this from now on. You watch Greater New Bethel. You watch J.C. Richards in Mount Sinai. You watch Waterway uh, Apostolic Church uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you notice that yesterday in the Church of Christ, the Bible says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course... In other words, one at a time, and let one interpret. If there be no interpreter, let them keep silence in the church and let them speak unto themselves and to God. Friends, this is no part of New Testament Christianity. They don't do anything like they did in the New Testament. They don't have any power like they had in the New Testament. He's full of excuses over here tonight, and he's actually impugning my character. What is it, what's wrong with me asking them to do what the apostles did on a regular basis in the first century? That is, demonstrate the power to confirm that they were sp spokesmen for God. The Bible says they did it everywhere they went. My, uh, signs were following, miracles were done, wonders were done. That was not a miracle, that was not a sign, that was not anything but just simply forgery. What they're doing is perpetuating a false doctrine that is built upon fake activity. And when you bring somebody that's not in their camp, this is what happens. And so, friends, we're basically allowing you to see it tonight. Now, I want to ask uh, Mr. Goad, uh, basically, to consider what happened in the first century. I knew this was going to happen, so we're going to go to Acts chapter 3, look on our graphic right here, and this is what happened. And a certain, lame, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, and they laid him daily at, daily at the gate of the temple, which called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, Look on us, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but here it comes. But such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, Mr. Gold says the power is not in the man, but we heard Jesus say, I give you power. And Peter heard it too. That's why he says in Acts chapter 3, such as I have, I give it to, unto thee, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. That's all he had to do. He didn't have to go through any of this other stuff. He just simply had to say, and he wasn't able to do it, and we saw no results. Acts chapter 4, verse 22 in the first century. The man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was showed. Not only that, Acts 4.14, the Bible says, And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. You see, the way Mr. Gold could have uh, silenced me tonight is all he had to do is be like they were in the first century. And I would have been sitting here dumbfounded. I would be overwhelmed. Now, he's fixing to take up his Bible over there, and he's already said that he has miraculous memory. He couldn't find the verse a while ago, couldn't come up with it in his own mind, so he's now given up. He's going back to the Bible. I knew he would. And this is basically the way it is in the first century, and we're not seeing it today. Now, look at Acts chapter 4, verse 16. This is what the opposition said, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. 
Friends, I can deny this very easily. Nothing happens here. Nothing happens there. It's always somewhere way over in West Virginia or Kenya or Africa, India, somewhere like that. No people in the hospital are being healed. No persons by simply passing by the shadow of J.C. Richardson are healed. This is all false. It is nothing like it was in the first century. Now, basically, here's our conclusion. From our study tonight, if this man is not made whole, there's one of four things. You do not have faith, Mr. Uh, uh, Gold doesn't have faith, or he doesn't have the power, or he doesn't have the compassion. And I basically believe when this is all told, when this story is told, they're going to put it on Marshall, that he did not have the faith in order to be healed. But there's actually four possibilities here. In the New Testament, it could have been the case that the healer didn't have faith. It could be the case the healer didn't have power. Or it could be the case the healer didn't have compassion. And finally, it could be the case that a person did not have the faith to be healed. I guarantee you when this story is told, they're going to blame Marshall because they're not going to take the blame. They they have sick people who need to be healed from healing, from uh, hearing. They're signing. They're doing sign language in Jackie Poe's church. I know people in J.C. Richardson's church that are sick. I guarantee there are people in this man's church that is sick. Uh, can I ask you a straight out question and you just answer me? Yes or no? Do you have a physical ailment? Yes. You do. Mm -hmm. And just not being healed. And the Apostle Paul had a physical ailment, ailment that Prove was not healed too. Prove that it was physical. Thorn in the flesh does not say it's physical. Thorn in the, in the flesh. It doesn't say friend. it was physical. In the flesh. Doesn't when you say, say flesh, what does that mean? It does not say that it was means physical. The body. It that doesn't means the say. Body. Flesh. So I tell you Thorn what. Thorn in the flesh. I tell you what, friends. We know that if you get out commentaries and read scholars, no one knows what Paul's thorn in the flesh is, but Mr. Goad, in order to cover up his own physical infirmity, is going to tell you tonight that he knows what it is. But I tell you this. I said a thorn in the flesh. Okay, I tell you this. I would say that you probably use Isaiah 53, verse 5, saying that our stripes will be healed. Uh, by his stripes, sorry, we're healed, and that that means we all have healing today, and you yourself are walking around with a physical infirmity. That ought to be a enough right there. They don't have, I, I just wanted to ask you that one question, they don't have what they claim. Now friends, basically that's all the time we have tonight. Uh, Mr. Gold has gone through his his uh, uh, two sessions, I've gone through my two sessions. We need to wrap up tonight. I apologize to the callers. We're going to take one call right quick. Uh, line four, you know what does the Bible say? Uh, hello? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Rena, this is questions for Johnny. Okay. Uh, Rena, I, call it, I was going to give you that scripture, what you just said, uh, but he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're already healed. We That's are right. healed. It don't say... No. Okay. Sir, listen to what Peter says about that. Peter was a man who had the Holy Ghost, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, this is what he says. He said, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, that we should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you're healed. We're healed from our sins, not our physical iniquities. Okay, so, what about the Isaiah 53, 5? Sir, uh, Peter is an apostle, and he is interpreting for you what Isaiah was talking about. He does not say it is your physical infirmities. The apostle Paul traveled around with a man named Epaphrodites, who he left sick. They traveled around with Timothy, who was told to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. All these individuals had these infirmities. They weren't all healed in the first century. That's what we're trying to say. Exactly, Healing, exactly. But what I was reading is that with these stripes, we are healed. And I'm letting Peter... Of anything. That could be of uh, flesh, sin. No. That could be of blindness. I no. Mean, according to what, and, and another, you know, as far as that goes, on, when I was looking at you the other day, you were saying something about 95 percent of the Baptists didn't believe something would be reborn with spiritual water or something like that. I mean, I didn't. I, didn't, I, I said the that, kingdom. That they don't that. believe what the kingdom. Saying? I said they do not believe the kingdom is here. They're premillennialists. They think the kingdom is coming in a thousand years. Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years in Jerusalem. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 through 9, that, that John was a brother in tribulation and in the kingdom. Colossians 1, 13 says you have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom is already in existence. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 9, Mark 9, 1, he said... He said that some of you are standing here who shall not taste of death till you shall see the kingdom come with power. And then he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power, which would be the sign the kingdom is coming. So, sir, that's what I was saying. I was saying the reason why we did not involve the Baptists in communion is because Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 29, that you will take the communion with him in their kingdom, and 95% of the Baptists don't even believe the kingdom is here. That's what I was saying. You didn't say anything about uh, being baptized or anything I like that? I said yet. John 3, 5, except you be born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom. Right, and I please. said the Baptists don't believe the kingdom is here. So why would I pretend that we're going to commune with Jesus in that kingdom when you don't even believe it's here? Well, exactly.
exactly okay well, as far as that goes. Uh, who baptized Jesus? What's that got to do with that question? John baptized Jesus. John the Baptist. He okay. was Baptist. That's not the Baptist church, sir. You can't get okay. the Baptist church from that. Look at this. Acts 14, 23, the apostles went around and ordained elders. Does that mean we're going to have a Presbyterian church? That's what that word is, presbyters. They ordain elders. So does that mean because they practice that we're going to have a Presbyterian church? That's the exact same argument, sir. There's no Baptist right. church in the New Testament. Okay. All right. Now, we got to go. We only have a few minutes, and we got to uh, close up with something that's about to take place next week. We appreciate you calling. I'll see. All right. All right, friends, we want to close out with something on our graphic here that's going to take place next week. This gentleman is going to be doing our broadcast next week. Let me let you listen to this clip. I say described in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. In the first century, the gospel was so powerful that the priests from the Jewish religion were crossing over into Christianity, becoming members of the Church of Christ. Someone might say, well, why did you say the Church of Christ? Because that's all there is in the Bible, so they had to be members of the Church of Christ. So Jason formally... What, what uh, was your particular denominational background, and to what level did you achieve as far as learning their doctrine? Well, I was an independent Baptist, and at the age of 16, I started preaching uh, a man-made gospel. And I went off to train at a, a school that taught a man-made gospel, Tabernacle Baptist College in Greenville, South Carolina. I graduated from West End Baptist College in Easley, South Carolina. And with all these credentials and all this uh, Baptist doctrine and uh, theology, I was still a very empty individual. I never could find peace. I never could find assurance because I did not know where to look. Well, uh, uh, not too long ago, I was watching the program, and I didn't agree with uh, Brother Johnny about baptism being uh, a part of the, the plan of salvation. So I, I said to myself, well, I'm going to debate this man one day. So I'm, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to go through the Bible and, and see what it says about baptism so I can argue with this man. And as I read the Word of God and as I realized that I had to put what man said out of my mind and take it for what it said, I realized that uh, the gospel that Brother Johnny was preaching it's not the gospel of Johnny Robertson, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result of me uh, reading the Bible and seeing the true gospel, uh, the power of God uh, uh, was able to uh, convince me that I was lost and in my sins. And so I obeyed the gospel, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for Brother Johnny, but I'm thankful for the Word of God and for the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. And now I have the peace and assurance that for about 10 years uh, I acted like I had and I preached to people and said I had, but I really did not. It was a lie. It was heresy. It was damnable doctrine. And now I am a member of the true Church of Christ. Amen. Join us next week, friends, to uh, Jason Harrison is going to preach why I left the Baptist Church. We also want you to join us on our uh, tent meeting that's coming up. You can join us on 120 American Legion, 10 o'clock for Bible class, 11 a.m. for worship. That's behind the Dutch Shopping Center off of North Main and Danville. We've just uh, begun the new work there. If you don't know how to get there, uh, ask around for the old Dutch Shopping Center. Uh, the, uh, the building is back there. Also, we remind you about that tent meeting and the debate that's going to take place. And we always want you to ask for what does the Bible say. God bless you. Good night. Tonight, it's Johnny Robertson and what does the Bible say? asking questions and examining doctrines, and taking your live phone calls. Preachers are welcome.